My name is Sarah Lewis. I am uh, a Ward 4 City Council member as well as the chair of the Environmental Action Committee and I'm glad to get to um, be here tonight. Terry Lane who is the champion of the uh, Fayetteville Community Wildlife Habitat Project um, is a member of the Environmental Action Committee and has put so much heart and soul into this project along with other members of the community. Uh, I know Cindy Cope has been heavily involved in this. Thank you. And um, the Na Fayetteville Natural Heritage Association. And of course, it's a, it's a partnership with the National Wildlife Federation. So I hope that um, some of you may have already uh, certified your, your yards, and that's great. And if not, maybe tonight you'll be inspired to do so. And, and uh, the Environmental Action Committee members can help you figure out how to do that. Of course, Terry Lane or myself, and we can get you connected and walk you through it. But Terry is, is um, we just have to give kudos to her for all the work that she's done and bringing you here tonight, inspiring a program that would bring you here on your, on your Monday evening. Bruce Shackelford is the president of the Environmental Consulting Operations, and he is, I would say, also a leader in about the importance of incorporating habitat into your own space um, and has also been heavily involved um, with, heavily involved, has been a leader in developing the wet, Woolsey Wetland Prairie, um, which has received national, yes, we'll give them a round of applause for that. <laughs> which is on the west, which is in Ward 4, which is on the west side of Fayetteville and is a wetland that was developed. Um, as a result of the building of our, our West Side Wastewater Treatment Facility, and it is a full restoration of a, of a wetland, and it's um, just magnificent. So thank you for that. So he's going to talk with us tonight about uh, backyard wildlife habitat, or excuse me, wildlife habitat management 101. How many people have already certified your property in this program? Very good. How many people intend to certify? Yay! Awesome. So how many people live on a lot in the city? And how many people have one to five acres? Okay, anybody with five to 15, 20 acres? Okay. And I just wanted to kind of give something that regardless of the size of your property, hopefully you take something home with you tonight that you can use to help you participate in this program. And it's not Yes, we want to get a lot of people signed up so that Fayetteville becomes the first certified wildlife habitat community in the state of Arkansas. And, but it's also not just that bean count, it's about taking care of the environment and creating and maintaining wildlife habitat. So there's a website uh, I have in the back, there's a handout. I have a handout with a list of multiple websites that have information that you can go to to help you be involved in this program and learn to plug in what fits for you. So you can go to the website and it tells you how to sign up. And on that website, it tells you you get a free one year subscription to the National Wildlife Magazine, a personalized certificate, and then you get habitat tips emailed to you once a month. And so that's a pretty doggone good deal. I can't pass that one up. So what it's all about and what the habitat tips are and the things that the wildlife need, they, they need food, they need water, they need cover, and they need places to raise their young. And so I'm gonna kind of cover a broad spectrum of different things you can do with different sized properties to achieve these goals. Some examples of food sources are things that you can do like native plants, uh, and people have heard me speak before one of the greatest things that happened, what was it, January of 2009, the ice storm. It, it did good deeds of getting rid of a lot of Bradford pear trees. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so not long after that, I put together some kind of list because I was thinking, well, you know, what we should do some things to encourage people to replant with, with native trees because that's what the wildlife depend on out there. And so things like Plants, native plants, or putting out seeds or fruits, either plants that produce those fruiting bodies, nuts, berries, nectar. So you can do that by planting things or actually putting out food sources for the wildlife. Examples of water sources, it can be very simple. It can be a, a bird bath, or you can have a little water feature. You can go to Home Depot and buy one of the little plastic koi ponds. You can make a water garden. 
or a rain garden, or you can do things if you have a stream on your property, or you can build a pond. Examples of cover include thickets, rock piles, birdhouses, and brush piles. And so people need to kind of get out of the, the mindset that, well, let's clean up our yard. There's all these limbs that have fallen off the trees like they always do, and we pile them up, and what do we do? We burn them. We really don't need to do that anymore because those little brush piles can be little micro habitats for a lot of wildlife. Same with rocks. If you're cleaning out rocks from a certain area, don't go fill in a gully and bury them. You can create a little rock feature where wildlife can live. Then there's other things like birdhouses. You can go online and find specific designs for birdhouses for the various species of birds. And then thickets. Um, thickets are really great. I have thickets on our property where the does have their fawns every year and, there's, and I'll get into the management tools, the mowing and things like that. I have certain areas that I bush hog, uh, little strips because this time of year the vegetation starts getting real unpalatable for the wildlife and you can, don't, don't do everything all at once. I tell people take baby steps. Go out and cut some old areas where the wildlife can come in there and feed but don't clean the platter, don't cut all the brush. And there are certain areas I might bush hog once a year. There are certain areas I might bush hog every three years. There are certain areas I may never bush hog. Example of places to raise young. Things like dense shrubs, uh, vegetation, nesting boxes, or even a pond for aquatic organisms. This basically is a situation where one size does not fit all. And so hopefully you can take some of these things and get creative. There's a lot of information online and find out what works best for you. So I want you to be aware, if you read the prospectus on this course, there will be a 50 question test <laughs> at the end of it. I hope you brought your number two lead pencils. And for every question that you missed, you will have to donate $5 to the Environmental Action Committee, $5 to the League of Women Voters, and $5 to the Fayetteville Natural Heritage Association. Visa, MasterCard, and checks accepted. So we, we always kind of, you hear people talking like, well, there's us humans, we're, we're different, and then there's the ecosystem. Well, we are a part of the ecosystem. We've just not always been a good part of the ecosystem. And some things are going to have to change. When, when you think about it, we're supposed to be the most highly evolved organism on the surface of the earth. But we are the only species that intentionally, purposely, makes others of our own kind suffer. Now, some organisms prey on other organisms, but it's not, it's for the purpose of survival, of eating or feeding their young. It's not to purposely do bad things to their own kind. So, I mean, you don't have the, the squirrel delegation sitting around going, well, you know, those chipmunks are really hitting on our time at the bird feeder. We need to take a bunch of green pine cones and stick down their tunnels. You, know, you don't see that in the animal world. Why, why are we that way? So does this kind of insinuate that, that the more intelligent we become, the less compassionate we are? Maybe those are the things we should think about. Why, why are we that way? So it's all up to us. It's about changing the process. And let's look at truth versus opinion. And there can be both. They can coexist. And let's find some commonalities because you're all here because you care about wildlife habitat. And there might be some people that believe in hunting, some people don't. Some people believe in using herbicides, some people don't. And that's okay if we have those differences. Fortunately, there are those of us that hunt and use herbicides that can save the world. But anyway, <laughs> seriously, we're gonna have differences. But you know what, there's a whole other group of the population out there they don't give a diddly squat about what's going on. It's all about the dollar. It's all about what can I gain. And so we have to find our commonalities and maybe we can learn from one another and share the information. So hopefully some of these things tonight, you can touch it and feel it and hear it and smell it and take it home with you and live it and breathe it. Okay, so one of the first things that I'm gonna recommend to you, you can do all these neat wildlife habitat things. But are you simply making a baiting station for cats? This is a huge thing, a huge thing. Because cats 
by nature. They are killers. A well-fed, well-taken-care-of cat is a killer. They love the thrill of the chase. And so oftentimes, any of you that have had a cat, was, well, that's kind of cute. Fluffy's brought a mouse to the back steps again. Or Fluffy's brought a, a dead bird again. And the numbers are devastating. That mouse might be some kind of rare species of vole. It might not be a mouse. Or there are all kinds of songbirds that are, are really taking a hard hit on the cats. And so some estimates say that there are over a billion birds in the United States killed each year by, by cats, by domestic cats. And they estimate there's over 81 million cats in the country. And a lot of these numbers, not the bird kill numbers, but as far as the number of cat numbers, that comes from some of the feline, the National Feline Associations. So approximately 43% of cat owners let their cats outside to roam. And so that's about 35 million of them that are out outdoors. If you add the number of feral and stray cats, which is another 60 to 100 million, that gives us about 116 million cats that are outside hunting every day. Another study in Michigan said that on the average, birds are killed at a rate of 0.683 birds each during the breeding season. 35 birds killed by each cat each year. And so if you extrapolate those numbers, it comes up to 4.1 billion birds a year. That's staggering. So I brought a little visual aid with you tonight to show you tonight. It, has anyone ever heard of a Bengal cat? We, we just, my wife and I just recently got a, a Bengal cat this, he's spoiled rotten, and this is him. He is a Bengal cat. They came on him by accident. It's, it's a, uh, they were doing some research on feline leukemia vaccines, and they were using Asian leopard cats, which exist in about 90 countries in Southeast Asia. And uh, so they had a domestic cat with an Asian leopard cat, and Nature kind of took its course, and even though they're different species and should produce a sterile hybrid, they found that about 15% of the females are fertile. And so then they took that generation and crossed them with something like an Egyptian mound. They started having a few males that were fertile, and then they crossed Bengal to Bengal until they got to the F4 generation, and they had the Bengal cat. So the Bengal, the actual wild, uh, Asian leopard cat shares about 99% of the same DNA as the domestic cat. And so to me, the, the point to make is that that DNA connection is still there and, and the hunter killer instinct is still there. And we as cat owners need to be responsible. I mean, he's, he's gonna be a killing machine. And so we watch him closely and he's not gonna be an outdoor cat. Also, outdoor cats have an average lifespan. If you care about your cat, really keep a close watch on them. They have an average lifespan of about three years. Whereas an indoor cat, it can have an average lifespan of about 12 years. So think, think it a little bit different when Fluffy brings a dead bird. And if you're not a birder and, and you don't understand, that might be some little warbler that is really on the decline that we're doing everything we can to hang on to their populations. So we named this cat Zibelzantiga, which is German for saber-toothed tiger. And so if you go, get online, you can even go to YouTube and search under Bengal cats, and, and they're really more like a dog for some reason. People teach them tricks. They love water. A lot of them like to swim. If you take a shower, they're liable to jump in there with you. You can teach them tricks like fetch, sit, shake. But I guess I got a, a reject. <laughs> a retard. The only trick I've ever been able to teach him, he's a retard, is how to drive. <laughs> but most of the time, he likes to sit on my shoulder and navigate. Take a left at the next intersection. So, I'm going to give this to you. It's a test question. What is my cat's name in German and how do you spell it? I've already told you. So if you missed that one, then it's ten dollars to Fayetteville <laughs> Natural Heritage and so forth Visa Mastercard accepted. So, 
Let's look at, at the toolbox. There's a toolbox of different things we can use and uh, that in the past have kind of been viewed as harmful to the environment, but if used properly, they can benefit the environment. Fire, mowing, seeding, planting, selective cutting, herbicides, and a game cam. Well, why do I say game cam? Well, it's because of this. If you're gonna answer the question of what do I have? What is out here? I look in my yard on the weekends, I'm sitting there at the bird feeder, drinking a cup of coffee on a Saturday morning, but most of the time I, I come and go. I really don't know what goes on in my property, especially if you have acreage. I don't know what comes and goes on my property at night. And so how do I know how I want to manage the wildlife if I don't know what wildlife I have? And so we have, um, at our home, we live on uh, 35 acres and west of Benton and Saline County, and then we have another uh, 40 acres on the North Fork of the Saline, not too far away. And so I have seven Cuddyback cameras, and they were originally devised for hunters, so they can see, well, where are the big bucks and where's the game and that sort of thing. But it's been very interesting because various types of wildlife studies are being done with these cameras because they, they have a little motion detector. You can get them to take pictures every 30 seconds, you can get them to do videos or some really high-tech cameras. And so there are, there are things on our property that I would have never known were there other than seeing a few tracks it, had it not been for these seven cutting back cameras. Here's some examples. There, there are coyotes, we have a lot of coyotes. And uh, most often I don't, I don't see them, I see them one at a time. Deer, there's a couple of fawns playing with one another. Uh, the, the Jake turkeys in the spring. Without the camera, I wouldn't know that I have 10 raccoons at my feeder. <laughs> and I wouldn't know that two hen turkeys with 10 poults are raising their young. And I wouldn't know that the Jakes are, and the gobblers are still after the hens, even though they're raising their young. And so I, I start thinking, well, I've got a pretty good turkey habitat out there. And turkey habitat is a little bit different than deer habitat. They need a little more open areas. They need tall grasses and things growing up. The young eat a lot of insects. It provides cover other than just a, a typical hardwood forest floor. I also see, this is less than 100 yards uh, from my front door, but the big bucks that come to the food plots and they come out there at night. I mean, one of my most exciting things I've gotten to see at the, the North Fork property there's quite a population of, of bobcats out there. And so I have beautiful animals. And so they come strolling by these deer feeders because there's, kind of, there's all kinds of little rodents that eat at the feeders. There's all kinds of birds. There's rabbits hanging around there. Uh, I think uh, a lot of the studies show that one of the primary things in their diet is, is squirrels. And so I've, I've got multiple, multiple pictures of bobcats and, and some studies I've read say that in the southeast where the habitat is suitable, you can have as many as one bobcat per square mile. Were it not for the cameras, I wouldn't get to see fun things like a mama possum carrying the babies on her back. And I wouldn't know that I have both red fox and gray fox that go around back and forth by the same feeder. I can tell when the bucks go into velvet this time of year and they're growing their antlers. I can tell when the bucks are fighting in the fall and sparring, and I know when the bucks are chasing the doe. And sometimes I see really bizarre things like this injury. I don't know what in the world happened to that fawn. It just got a, a picture of a, a part of it, but it's amazing what, what cruelty nature brings to little animals, but the things that they can survive. And also I wouldn't know if I didn't have the cameras that if there's food on the ground, People think, well, the deer paw at it. They paw through the snow to get to the food. No, they root like a pig. I have multiple pictures like this where they're rooting through the snow. And then uh, also I wouldn't know that, that deer love to be photographed. Like this doe like to get in the photo booth. <laughs> <laughs> so that she could have her picture taken. And then there are certain times of the year when I get pictures of a lot of does, but and maybe they've had a fawn like in May or June. And, they stash the baby somewhere, and they'll go back and, and tend to it, and they'll finally start bringing it out when, they're, when it's trying to get weaned a, a little bit. 
And so you'll see the fawns, the little spotted fawns, as they're getting up in size, but you don't often see them when they're tiny, tiny like that. And then uh, the gobblers, uh, the, the deer that come across my driveway, and I also have a camera on my driveway, and there's kind of an odd story about it. It, it took this picture I'm getting ready to show you that uh, um, I had forgotten about the picture until I went out there and got my flash card. Well, well, my wife is from Florida, and so she has become very ruralized. I have to, to give her credit, but she grew up in Florida, and there were always things about alligators and snakes falling out of trees and things like that. And, and so we have this long, long driveway through the woods and these big trees, and she says, any time I drive down, the, you know, we hadn't lived there very long, and any time I drive down the driveway, well, I roll my windows up because I'm afraid a snake might fall inside the window of my car. And, and I said, oh, yeah, we have those glider vipers here. They'll lay up <laughs> on a limb, and they're, they're like the hog-nosed snake, except just spreading out their head. They spread out their whole body, and they can glide. And they'll land on your dash, and they'll nail you. So it's good you're keeping the, the, your windows up. So anyway, needless to say, my wife has a phidiophobia. And, but she has evolved to where she has her own ATV and her own weed eater and her own chainsaw and her own snake chaps. But sometimes I'll hear her working somewhere on the property and I'll hear this blood curdling scream and I'll go, yep, Kathy saw a snake. <laughs> so anyway, this next picture I'm gonna show you, I was going to do some work on the front of our property and I got on my tractor one morning and so I, I came around the front of the house and there was this big black rat snake that was like, five feet long. And uh, so I thought, okay, it, you know, if I've got a, a rattlesnake or a copperhead at my back door, he might, might not be his lucky day. But this guy is there for a purpose. And people, you don't need to kill snakes. You don't need to kill snakes. They're there for a purpose. So here was this big black rat snake, and I decided, well, I'm going to do a, a black rat snake relocation program. And so I... I picked him up, and as I, one of my cameras on the driveway, as I was driving down the driveway, well, I had the snake. Well, when I come back to the house, my wife goes, Hank? She always calls me Hank. And, and she says, I could have sworn I saw you. I, I just got where I don't ask anymore, but I have to say something. I saw you driving your tractor carrying a six-foot rattlesnake down our driveway. And, and I said, no, it's a black rat snake. And I was relocating it. I was talking with a, an official with the, um, a local utility company in a local, in a nearby county. <laughs> uh -huh. And um, we were just talking about wildlife and so forth and talking about growing up quail hunting over in Madison County, which is what I used to do as a kid. And, and of course, there's hardly any quail anymore. And, uh -huh. and I asked his comment about that. I thought, you know, it'd be neat if these right of ways for the power lines could maybe be developed in the quail habitat. And his comment was, well, he goes, you've got to take care of the predators. And of course, obviously, you've obviously informed us about the cats. But I, and I asked him, I said, well, what type of predators are you referring to? And he said, oh, he says, the hawks, the owls, the foxes, and the coyotes, and went on and on and on. I go, you know, I didn't know quite how to respond to him. I wanted to say, well, how about if we provide the habitat first? But you no, comment, what would you say to a person that said that to me? That's a very good point, be, because, you know, some people say, well, the, the predators are on the rise. Right. Because the fur market is bottomed out, people aren't yeah. trapping, uh, and coyotes are very hard to trap anyway. They're a lot harder to trap than bobcats. But there, there were always quail and predators right. before there were trappers. Right. And so to me, it's an issue of, of habitat and things like the prairies here in northwest Arkansas and the native grasses and where the little baby quail could walk. You know, you see big plants on the prairie but after a prescribed burn, you look and you see how far apart they're spaced. They just look real dense because the inflorescence comes up. And so over the years, so many people, my arch villain enemy plant, tall fescue, they've planted it everywhere. The, the seeds can be toxic to quail. The little baby quail, they need insects and it's, it's just not suitable habitat. So to me, it, it is more habitat issue than a predator issue. Uh, BASF, has done, uh, tried to do some programs, quality vegetation management programs, and they started a project habitat program because they sell a lot of chemicals to 
the power line companies because the power line companies are required by federal law to keep trees from growing up in the power lines. And so I worked with um, the Arkansas Valley Electric Co-op because part of their power lines go through the Ozark National Forest. And so they were wanting approval. They had to get special approval to use herbicides. And people think, oh my gosh, ethyl methyl death. You're going to use herbicides on federal land. But when you think about it, there's some very smart chemicals. We need to get over the, the Agent Orange, uh, Vietnam, defoliate everything so we can see people to shoot kind of thing at, because there are some very smart chemicals if used properly. And so you think of a crew of people who are walking up a power line right away with backpack sprayers and they're selecting the trees, sweet gum and things like that that are gonna grow fast and get up into the power lines. Or you go, well, I'm against chemicals. So let's go out there with a bush hog that's turning 30,000 RPMs. And the guy on the bush hog, there's gonna be a sumac thicket there and the sumac's never gonna grow up in the power lines. And they're gonna go through it and they're gonna hit box turtles and lizards and snakes and fawns and bird nest and everything. And so that's one of the advantages of the smart chemicals over the mechanical, although mechanical is appropriate at times. All right, let's get back on track. If we can, adaptive management here, as far as creating and sustaining habitat, is not only about what to plant, it's about what to control. And so I just kind of to put on my vegetation management eyeglasses when I look at my property and I think, well, what, you know, there's some stuff here that if I got rid of it, I could have some things growing here in its place that would really benefit the wildlife better and really be better habitat, whether it provides food, cover, or, or whatever. And so those are the things that I go after by various means. That, that's the same exact approach that we took at, at Woolsey Wet Prairie with adaptive management. We actually had a contract with a contractor it was a very degraded, uh, I had to get on my Woolsey Wet Prairie pedestal, sorry, got to. Okay, we just had three more species. We started out with 47 plant species and it was a very degraded fescue pasture. And we thought, well, we're gonna have to come in, we're gonna have to spray herbicides, we're gonna have to uh, get the seeding contract and plant all these native seeds. And as we started changing the hydrology, which it was a key thing, and then sp uh, spraying herbicides, things like do a prescribed burn, first thing that's gonna come back is tall fescue. So go out there with a graminicide, a grass-specific herbicide that hits that tall fescue while all the good native stuff's dorm uh, dormant before it's come out of dormancy. See, fescue is a cool season grass. That'll be the first thing that comes back. So as we started peeling back those layers, uh, we started seeing more plant species. And so we had I called David Jurgens, the city utilities director. I said, we have this $150,000 contract we have this, with this contractor to come in and seed this. I want to cancel it. We're not, we don't need it. And so now we added three more uh, species. Theo Whistle does the plant inventories for me. So we're like up to, from 47 plant species to 381 plant species. And it it's, didn't seed. It's from pulling the layers back getting those, those stressors, those competitors, pulling them back, getting them out of the way, because some of the good stuff's there. And so what is known? There's over 50,000 species of plants and animals that have been introduced into the United States, 2,000 species of alien plants. Even in the Russian Arctic, there's over 100 alien species, and this is not only a major threat to wildlife habitat, because it, it, some of those plant species are very invasive. It's extremely expensive to us in the world of agriculture. And they, this is a global thing that's going on. And as we see climate change and global warming and things, it's like it only gives these invasive plants the one up. And so during the last three centuries, thousands of plant species have been brought to North America. Some of it intentional, some of it accidental, some of it inadvertent. Uh, and so the ecological consequences are is that they outcompete the native stuff. So things like our natural heritage that we're trying to preserve, not only from somebody building houses on it or, or developments or shopping centers, 
our natural heritage is being threatened by some of these invasive species. Those are the ecological consequences. A weird thing, I, some years back after Hurricane Katrina, I went to the National Wild Invasive uh, Plant Species Week. It was a, a big seminar given at Washington, D.C., and I went to it. And the big uh, thing was all the Humvees. And they were starting to see it for all the, the military that went to rescue people after Hurricane Katrina. Well, they were going down in these Louisiana swamps where there are all these invasive aquatic plants and taking food and supplies and doing different things. And then they were coming back and they might drive that with their troops, that Humvee, back to Iowa. And there's all this stuff hung under that Humvee. And they didn't, they didn't have any running water. They didn't have any way to clean it off until they got back to their home base and then nobody thought about it. And so they started saying, well, there are some things being spread by rescue efforts going to rescue people from hurricanes. So anyhow, circling back around, and, and if we could all be here uh, 200 or 300 years ago, and we look at an area and we go, that's a natural area. And, and it, it would look very different than what we see today that a lot of people see is that's a natural area and things have changed dramatically. So uh, a lot of the riparian areas, I see these little trees and that have all these little things that look like cherries on them. And they're pretty neat looking little plant. You think, wow, that, the birds must really like that. And there are even people I know who've dug them up and planted them in their front yard and, and it's Lonicera macchiai. It's bush honeysuckle. And, you, and a lot of people think, well, it's native. It's growing next to our riparian zones. And it's something we need to get rid of. I mean, it rates up there with Bradford Pears, my gosh. So, <laughs> redefining what is natural, we don't need to lose as far as our natural heritage. That's what's natural. So, as you plant things, and if, and if they are not native, if they are going to be invasive and you can't control them, then please do something about getting rid of them because they damage our environment. Next in the toolbox here, uh, all these pictures are from my wife and my property, except this, these next few, they're from Woolsey Wet Prairie. Uh, fire is a good management tool. If you live on a small property, you may not want to do fire. If you live on a bigger property, prescribed burn will do a tremendous things to improve the habitat. Please be aware that if you do a prescribed burn, you better know how to do it. You better get a fire line put in. You can hire trained crews to do it. You're required by law if you're going to do a prescribed burn to report it to the Arkansas Forestry Commission. And you need to study things like and you're con like when we plan for the burns at Woolsey Wet Prairie, we have a burn contractor and we're constantly watching the weather, watching the weather. What's the relative humidity going to be at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon? What's the wind going to be? We have enough fuel out there, but what is the fuel moisture? And you watch all those variables. And so it's like you're on call for 24 hours or less when finally you go, okay, let's jump in there and do it. I've done burns on my property by myself when I've had good fire lines put in and two or three mile an hour winds and there wasn't a whole lot of fuel. I wanted a nice, slow, gentle burn. I would be very, very careful about doing burns on your own. Herbicides, I mean, uh, bush hogging or mowing very important tool. It's just, don't do it like everybody's been doing it for eons. There, there are certain times when mowing can be great for invasive. For instance, when we had first had the cattle removed from Woolsey Wet Prairie, and it was no longer being hayed, and we go out there one day and we go, oh my gosh, what is the first thing that's coming back? That fescue is starting to get this tall. And we know we have to come up with a strategy to get rid of that fescue and if we let that fescue go to seed, there's gonna be billions of more seeds out there. We've gotta stop that. So we had OMI, the people that operate the wastewater plant, they come out there and I said, I don't want it, don't have your hay and uh, eyeglasses on. I want you to cut it about a foot tall because there are things that still live down there. There are little plants I don't want disturbed. I want the top of the fescue cut off. Same thing with things like Johnson grass. Don't let it go to seed. Johnson grass is, is a perennial. It's going to have a five-foot taproot. You're going to have to use a herbicide to get rid of it. No way around it. But you're not going to pull it up. There's still a taproot down there. But don't let it go to seed. 
or you're going to fight that battle for a lot longer. Uh, herbicides, we, we've used uh, herbicides at Woolsey Wet Prairie with really good results. We could not have done what we've done without the use of herbicides. And I, I put a lot of research in herbicides my, on my property. It's basically my lab where I take baby steps. I try out some of these chemicals. I see that how they're going to work. How, whenever you use a herbicide, you need to get a herbicide license if you're going to buy restricted use chemicals. Don't just go buy glyphosate, Roundup off the shelf, and spray it. It can be a really good product if used properly, but the label is the law. There's been a lot of research on herbicides. They can be beneficial if the label is the law, and you follow that, that label. People think, well, if it says use this much per acre, it's going to do a lot better job if I use twice per acre, and that's not the case. So herbicides can be beneficial. Just be careful if you use uh, herbicides. There's this guy that has a, a blog around here, and he has a gray beard, and he's liable to walk around with a camera under his arm and ask, what are you doing there? <laughs> Love Aubrey. He makes people think. <laughs> so the key is diversity. You don't want a monoculture of one kind of thing. And even in your backyard, if you just have a small city lot, the, the key is diversity. So try to provide diverse types of food and cover and water and what have you. And so here's an example of uh, this part of our property is, is pine timber. And so you get all this pine thatch there. Ain't going to be diddly squat grow up in there. So I, I burn it off. Uh, and I'll show you some pictures of what it looked like before it was thinned down to pine trees. But I am progressively... There's oak trees coming back in there on their own, plus there's some that I've planted. And so I'm progressively thinning things like the sweet gum, but I want the, the willow oak and the water oak and the swamp chestnut oak to come up in there. And so they're going from this size to like this size. Even in the short time I've lived there, they're starting to get more sunlight. But, uh, you know, just the things that compete against them. Here on our... Are they burning, though, if they're growing, if they're little guys? What now? The question was, do I continue to continue to burn if there are little saplings? It depends. There, there's a whole uh, schedule of burning, and, and it's like I've always said about adaptive management. Timing is everything, but you can't ever schedule anything. You don't know what Mother Nature is going to do from one year to the next. So sometimes the, if you go in there during a dormant period and you do a burn and it might not be a, a real hot burn, it might not hurt some of those little saplings. But if you're wanting to make grasslands and, and shrubby areas and you've and you got a whole bunch of sweet gum saplings coming up, then, then burn it during the active growings early in the spring while, while it's not dormant, and it will knock them back. But they will return, just like mowing. You know, when you, you take a, a woody plant of any ty type and you cut it, what, how's it going to respond? it's going to increase the stem density. And, and so it's like a, a weird way of bonsaiing plants. It's going to come back. It's not going to be as big and tall, but it's going to send out a whole lot of shoots. That's how the, the plants respond. So here's an area that, that I burned on our uh, North Fork property. This picture was taken a, a couple of weeks ago. And there were all these vines, very thick vines. And yes, they serve a purpose, but there wasn't a whole lot down low to the ground for things like the deer and, and the turkey to get to. And so the same scenario, what happened was it opens it up because it burned away a lot of those vines that are perennials that are going to return. It killed the tops of them. The little stems down at the ground are still alive. They're gonna send up new shoots, but it's gonna be down where they have access by the wildlife. Plus the forest floor now has better sunlight. So you get various types of forbs and grasses that that grow up in there. That's what that fire has done. Uh, likewise, same here, and plus you have a lot of dead leaf litter and things on the ground. There might be certain plants that their, their seeds aren't getting enough sunlight or their little shoots aren't getting enough sunlight. You need to pull that layer off so they can get sunlight. And so when you do these things and thin out areas, you start making habitat for the wildlife and you see them start coming in there. 
things, areas where I mow. If you ever notice, sometimes you'll mow, mow an area and, and two or three days later, there'll be deer out there eating because all, all the dead stuff that's real fibrous and not palatable, especially if it's in a food plot, you've knocked that back down out of the way and they can then get to the food. Some of the other things, my, some of my very best friends are these big magnificent trees on our property and I do things to baby them. And, and I cut their old, old trees and they've survived some of the storms. We've lost some of them. You just look out your backyard and go, oh my gosh. Uh, we, we had, uh, during uh, Ivan and Gustav, those hurricanes, we lost like 17 uh, big trees. So these guys, I try to help them. If they get, uh, when they get to the point that they have the big woody poison ivy vines, that big growing on them, I, I cut those vines off of them. They'll, they'll strangle them. Be very careful, don't spray those big vines with herbicide, because you could kill that big tree. Whatever will kill a big woody poison ivy vine will also kill a big tree. We have other areas. You can see these little plastic things, tree tubes. This is kind of a, a bottom land hardwood area on part of our property. And then we have areas with dead trees. And dead trees are a good thing. They provide shelter for things like squirrels and woodpeckers. It provides food. There are various types of insects that birds feed on. And so we had this big tree that died and I didn't want to cut it down, but I didn't want the top to break off and I didn't want to have to go out there as it began to decay and uh, keep dragging limbs out of the way. And so I had a, uh, a tree cutting crew come cut the dead limbs off of it and uh, leave the main trunk. And, but where I have areas where I don't have danger of limbs falling, I just let them fall, I'll, I'll leave the limbs on there. And people need to be very careful because sometimes there'll be a tree die and they think, oh, well, I need to go out there and cut it and tidy things up, you know. And there are people killed every year because if, if you don't cut that tree pretty soon after it's died, there's a great risk of big limbs or the whole top of the tree breaking and, and falling on you and killing you. There, there are people that get killed by that every year. Other things, when I have my wildlife management glasses on, that's not the best picture in the world. But that's something that you see on herbicide labels. It, this kills ragweed. And it, ragweed is a very, the deer love ragweed. They, I see where they nip on it and bite on it all the time, especially if you mow it every now and then and keep it knocked back a little bit. Don't cut it right down to the ground, but the deer love the ragweed. And same with other selective mowing that I do. That was a real bright sunlight flash, but there's little areas where I might be mowing whether it's something like Johnson grass or beefsteak mint that I don't want to go to seed, it doesn't have as good a wildlife value, and I'll cut little strips and I'll cut that, but then when I come up to a, a stand of, of something like Canada wild rye, like you see on the left there, why well, I'd leave it because it is a food source and it also has a cover for some of the ground birds species. So if you can kind of put your eyeglasses on and, and learn, well, what What's going to be beneficial? What's not? What can I kind of trim back? And there'll be other little things come up where you cut back the, the Johnson grass and what have you that will be a lot more beneficial. Other types of food that you can provide or things like uh, keeping your feeders filled. Um, I know a lot of people about August, September, well, the, the hummingbird season's about over, so we're going to put our hum hummingbird feeders up and I guess Doug could probably tell us. I mean, those little guys come through here in even October and early November. And uh, I think, you know, once you start feeding them, continue to keep the feeders out there. And the shepherd's hooks, we like the shepherd's hooks to hang different types of feeders on uh, because they're also staging areas. And so there's all different kinds of birds that use them. And so our hummingbird feeder, the other one I showed you that has shepherd's hooks, the hummingbirds come there to the feeder, but the bluebirds come land on the shepherd's hook, and they'll stand there and they'll look for some kind of insect on the ground, and they'll dive down on the ground and get that insect, and they'll come, come back and perch. And then the phoebes, you know, they're fly catchers, and so they're sitting there and they'll go out and they'll catch an insect out of the air, and they'll come back and, and stage there. So those little staging areas are are very important. 
because it gives them access to see their food so they can get it. Feeding, feeding deer is sometimes been controversial. I think a lot of that was started by hunters and at some of the big ranches in Texas. I feed, and some people call it baiting, and yes, in a way it is baiting, but um, I feed, uh, in fact, that, that's a very recent picture I'm feeding this time of year because we're getting into a nutritional stress period of the year. And there's not a lot of palatable food out there. You've got does with fawns that they're nursing. There's very heavy parasite loads. They need some nutritional help. I don't feed deer corn. I used to feed deer corn. The problem with deer corn is it's about 7% protein. And so you've got those lactating mothers that need more protein this time of year. You have the bucks that have antlers that they're trying to grow. They need higher protein. Their corn is like candy to them. And most corn is the throwaway corn. And it has aflatoxin in it, which is like a, a fungus that will make them very, very ill. So what I feed and what you see in there has a little bit of corn in it that comes in the bag. And I just fr feed free flow feeders so that, that they can come up and they can get proper nutrition. And what I, I just go to Far Farmers Association and I get goat ration. It's 16% protein and the deer love it. And then some of the big hunting uh, paraphernalia companies came out with this stuff called buck grub. It came, came in a sack and they, on the outdoor channel you'd see them putting this white powder stuff out and it lures these big bucks in. The guy's got this big buck and Finally, I, I saw something of it and I thought, well, I know what that is and I can probably get it about a tenth of the cost. So I go to Southern Farmers and I get rice bran. It's 12% protein. And to put a pile of that out there and they will eat it. They come up right in our uh, backyard. And so another problem with feeding is you get contact to contact with the animals a lot more. And there are things like a little gnat that flies around that bites one deer and then it goes and, and bites another deer and it transmits different types of diseases. It's like commonly what they call the uh, hemorrhagic septicemia is what it is, but they commonly call it the blue tongue disease. Well, the deer are in herds anyway, and they're gonna go to food sources anyway, but there's a, a resolution for the parasites that I'll show you in a minute. Also for nutritional purposes this time of year, you'll get a deer to use a salt block this time of year more than you will during the, the hunting season. So I keep salt blocks out all the time. That hole, I didn't dig that hole. That's where the deer pawed it away. I just happened to put a, a new salt block in there or you can put it on a uh, stump. For food plots, they need, uh, and this is not just deer because food plots benefit all wildlife as far as songbirds, turkeys, rabbits, uh, quail, things of that nature, game and non-game species. And so all of these species need some continuity of food sources through the stressful times of the year. So you, you have like the end of the winter stress period when all the good food has not quite come back. They've nibbled the twigs off the end of the branches. The acorns are gone. The seeds, birds can't find the seeds. And there's a stress period before Mother Nature starts bringing the food. And then you get back into September and you get another stress period. It's before the acorns fall. It's before the dogwood berries start dropping. And so you have another stress period there. And so food plots can be very beneficial to all types of wildlife. And so what I plan is both cool season and warm season plots so that they have some type of sustained food sources available throughout the year. And so here is a uh, cool season food plot. And in my cool season food plots, I'll, I'll plant things like uh, oats and wheat and uh, clover. I always have clover in there. You need a legume and then uh, turnips. And so it comes up and now it's starting to die back. But all those are annuals. And so if you go in there and you think, I've, I've got the tidy gene in my brain going on. I need to mow this. Don't do that. Let all those plants go to seed because you can sustain that food plot even though they're annuals. If you let them go to seed, you can keep that food plot coming back for like three years or better before you have to get in there and use fuel and disc it up and fertilize it and replant it. So in the meantime, it's providing a source of cover. And so I 
come in there sometimes and I may cut little strips. I progressively do it. I do baby steps. Remember, do the baby steps when you're testing out a, a chemical and you're not familiar with herbicides. Do baby steps to prevent catastrophic things. So here's an example of this end of that food plot where I, I did this probably about two weeks ago. I knew the turkeys were finished nesting. It's a very small area, so I walk all out there and I look first before I drive out there with my tractor and bush hog it. So now it's knocked back and that clover that's been shaded out underneath is starting to come back up, even though the clover's cool season. And they will, um, they're coming out there and feeding. Here's an example of a food plot uh, in my pine forest and I've done some clearing of the sweet gum and things and uh, you can see the like areas like this, these, these brush piles. That is just a haven for all types of small mammals and rodents and birds and things. Don't, don't burn those brush piles. And so I'm leaving uh, different types of little hardwoods, which I'm getting some really good sized hardwoods now, and selectively cutting them. But then about the only herbicides I use on my property is I have a, a spray tank on my ATV and I want to keep the sweet gum from coming back. They will totally take over. Typical cool season plants for food plots. And I'm, you don't have to have acreage to do this. I've lived on a much smaller property. I had a, a 20 by 40 or 50 area that I planted a food plot in and I had deer coming up in my yard eating out of that food plot. Not to mention various types of birds and things that benefit from the seeds and the fruits that are provided in the vegetation. So the typical cool season Plants, clover, rye, oats, all the cereal grains, wheat, turnips, Austrian winter peas, the warm season plants, buckwheat, vetch, sorghum, brown top millet, cow peas. I don't have any good pictures of my cool season plots like I did the one, uh, my warm season plots like I did of the, the cool season that was mowed, but I do have some plots that, that what's coming on now is the sorghum and the brown top millet. So even in my front yard, uh, my wife and I, we planted some uh, clover and the deer come up there, they jump the fence and they bed down in the front yard. But then this can create problems. Deer love hostas. And so sometimes we go out there and hear my wife screaming. Well, no, that wasn't a snake scream. There's something else going on. And once they find them, and especially this time of year, things are dried out and those hostas have those nice succulent green leaves, you'll, you'll go out there and I mean, they'll be that tall. They'll eat them down to the ground. Uh, kind of advanced techniques that, that I've used. I had a guy I found that had a, a timber mulcher and I hired him to come out because there were some areas where you go and, and it's just the, the property we had, the timber had been cut off of it in 1983 and then nothing had ever been done to it. And so you go to these areas, I mean, you couldn't even drive an ATV through it. It was just a whole bunch of sweet gum, about like this. And I wanted to, to knock those back and leave pines and hardwoods and get rid of those sweet gums because I knew I'm going to get something better growing that's within reach of the wildlife and better for the wildlife. But even though sweet gums are native, they are mighty invasive. And so I want to get rid of them. So the advantage, instead of having someone go in with a dozer, and they're uprooting these trees and bringing subsoils to the surface and you have all these soils exposed and it rains on it and erodes and it causes, runs off to the streams and causes water quality problems. A lot better solution that you can really manicure with more fine-tuned precision is a timber mulcher. So this guy came out with a timber mulcher. He said, if you ever drive up here and I'm running it, do not um, get in front of me or behind me say to the side, because if I can get in an old fence row or something, and if I hit a steel T-post, it'll, it'll bend it like a hairpin, it'll throw it 100 yards, and you do not want to be in the path. Here's a prime example of the area where he stopped. So on the right was all this stuff that you think, oh yeah, it's lush, it's green, this is all really good stuff, but it was mainly sweet gum. And so as a starting point. I want that cleared out. And as you can see on the left, you don't have uh, places where a dozer has uprooted trees. All you have is mulch. Nice organic mulch on top of the ground. 
and you can go in and disc it, <coughs> and you can turn it into something like this. And of course, make sure you leave the brush piles over there. Water. Water can be as simple as things like a creek. We have a little bitty creek that runs beside our house. And I go down there and we maintain the, uh, it's nice to walk down there, except when you step on the cottonmouth or something. There, there's a lot of them down there. But um, we have maintained, the people that lived there before had removed a lot of the riparian vegetation and it's really a clean, clear little stream. We removed, they removed a lot of the riparian vegetation and we're letting it grow back up because it has a great effect on algal growth and things like that in that stream by the sunlight warming up the temperatures and it changes the habitat which changes what can live there. Different things my wife's gotten from antique shops can also serve as water features. Uh, a simple bird bath, you've met part of the requirements for the program for developing uh, water for wildlife. And then uh, I bought this at an antique shop one time. A guy had this old steel and this this big uh, copper candy kettle and it and it was double walled and it has this pipe where, where they would pump cold water through the double jacket on this kettle and I'm, I mean it this thing is like this big and there was that still and uh, I said, I've seen these in here before. What do you want? He said, oh, I'm tired of them sitting here. 50 bucks, I'll give them both to you for 50 bucks. Well, I mean, the scrap copper is probably worth more than that, but just for the antiquity of it. And I thought, well, okay, that's cool. So we made a, a water feature out of it. On our North Fork property, uh, I had a, a contractor build a pond for me. I designed the pond as something that warrants a lot of study. If you're going to dam up a creek or a stream that is waters of the United States, you will need a 404 permit through the Corps of Engineers. So you need a jurisdictional determination. You need to look at the watershed. How big is that watershed? What are the flows going to be during the typical annual rain events? Is my pond going to be big enough where I store water? My volume that I store is greater than the evaporative volume or do I have the right materials where I can have compacted clay there and it's not gonna be a seat pond and never hold water. I've seen people build those ponds. Oh, it's gonna be a great pond and it never holds water. And so there are many things and then calculating the spillway dimensions. And so I just did that myself and designed it. You, there's a tremendous amount of information through programs like USDA and RCS. And it's kind of neat to build a pond. You see this big red clay hole in the ground and then a year or two later, you start seeing life in it. And so there were trees either where the pond was or right next to the pond that I knew would not withstand the hydric conditions. And I knew they were going to die anyway, so, I, so that's one of the criteria, cover. And so I wanted to provide cover, so I just cut a lot of these trees off and let them fall down in there. And so they provide cover, even uh, not wood ducks, that raise their babies out there so they have protective cover along the shoreline. Then it's not that expensive. You can go to Farmers Association. If you ever go to Farmers Association, pay attention, you know, in the spring on the door, fish day. You know, and there'll be some big tanker truck coming by with fish. We'll put some study into, you know, what I want to stock it with, catfish and bass and brim and bluegill and, and uh, fathead minnows. The bass have to have something to eat. And it's kind of neat to have that and play with your pet fish and feed them and throw the pellets out there. And here's one I caught the other day. I throw a line out there every now and then to see what I have. And then I let them go and throw them back in there. But these catfish, you know, they were like two inch fingerlings when I got them. It's kind of neat to sit out there sometimes and, and watch the kingfishers. And they come down and, and feed on the fish. And then down at the end, I've got a, a wood duck box that's, that's a place to rear their young, and you can tell it kind of starts overflowing because they pull the down off their breast, and they, they line that nest and, and hide and run off to and, and kind of dodge the squirrels that come in or the blue jays or the crows. He, he's probably not going to come there. But since we built these rock features, we start seeing things like chipmunks. 
Um, then that's just some other examples of cover, uh, riparian vegetation that we've left. There's a little trail that goes around there, but we leave the riparian vegetation. Areas that I bush hog, uh, I just get out and walk and look and see what the wildlife are doing. So like this time of year, a big stand of a sumac, if you go in there and look, you'll see beds where the does, they're going in there with their fawns during the heat of the day and they're bedding down. And so not only does that sumac provide some food value when the fruit matures, but it also is a nice place for them to get out of the shade and provide cover and bedding. One of the big things we have that's always been one of my favorites is called the American Beauty Berry or French Mulberry. There's a lot of it uh, that grows and, and you can do some creative pruning on it. And so, you know, let it go through the, the fall weather. It has those big purple berries during the fall. The deer and birds and things eat on them. And then when it starts going dormant in the winter before the spring bloom up, we'll start trimming it and cut it back. And so that's gonna increase the stem density. So it's gonna have a whole lot more stems that produce a whole lot more fruit the following year. And it also serves as good thickets for the deer to, to hide in and get shade in. Here's another technique I use. There's an area that I didn't want to get a timber mulcher in there because yeah, I do on where I want to plant something and I do if I want to open it up, really open it up. But here's a different technique that I use. I wanted to open an area, but I wanted to provide cover. And this is called tree hinging. And in tree hinging, what you do is you go in there and this, this whole area used to look like the background over here. You couldn't even see through there, it was so dense. So this little valley way, I thought, well, okay, I'm gonna do, I wanna make a thicket in there, but I want it to be a living thicket. And so I'm gonna do it by tree hinging. So instead of cutting the tree all the way through, what you do is, is cut it at a slant and keep pushing on it. And, and usually when you get about halfway through it a little bit more, push that tree over and leave it connected to that living stump. Don't cut the, honey, the honeysuckle vines or the uh, muscadine vines, all right? Don't cut those vines, leave them attached to the, the tree. And so what you're gonna have is this living brush pile and the vegetation continues to grow. And those little trees will eventually die. But in the meantime, I've opened up that little valley to all of this myriad of trees that provides cover for all kinds of bird and wildlife and it also brings browse down lower to the ground that they can eat on. Also, if you cut, uh, cut it about between waist to chest high on me is, is what I do, because that, that tree trunk and all the top of the tree is out like this, and that trunk is up off the ground, so the animals can, like a deer, will get up under there and, and uh, bed down. Places to raise young, which it could be a, a tree hinge, Pile. There's an overlap of things, resources that provide food and water and cover in places to raise young. So here I want to have areas for my little turkey poults and the predation on them is tremendous uh, with the predators out there. But uh, I, I want a diversity of areas for the turkey to raise their young, diversity of areas for the deer to raise their young, and even for the birds that are in our Yard. We see all kinds of neat birds in our yard, bird houses, places for them to rear their young, or certain types of trees that we really take extra special pains to protect that they're going to nest in, or even portions of our home. This, in the alcove, the front of our house, there's this lantern, and the Phoebes build nest up there. And uh, we really enjoy watching the Phoebes, and I have to get up there and take a snapshot picture, and. So I look at, well, what's in that Phoebe nest? And sometimes they'll build them up under an eave and they'll keep sticking mud on there and they'll keep adding things to it. And it'll just be hanging on the side of a wall under an eave. And it was always fun to see the uh, Phoebes. That was their staging area, an old uh, lawn or chair that I think it was a, a, the old timey uh, soda fountain chair. And they would stage right there and go up to the nest. So some of the things that that my wife and I do to help them have sources of building materials. It's very simple things that people typically 
throw away. So if you have dogs, if you've ever studied bird nests, there's different types of hair in bird nests. It might be hair from a horse tail, it might be fuzz from uh, rabbit fur or whatever. So when, what we do is when we uh, blade our dogs, that's my wife Kathy and our dog Bandit, why I save the fur and then we like to grow all of these uh, baskets, uh, which are the, the hanging baskets. That's the coconut, the jute. So you take all that fur and you got it there on the ground, you raked it up and you got grass clippings in there with it by accident and you get the jute fiber from the hanging baskets and go out there to your squirrelola cage that's only used during the winter or your woodpecker block cage and the birds will, different types of birds will come up there and they get that material and they build their bird houses. Planting. You can do different types of planting. So what I want to plant, what are my candidate species, where do I get them, where are their habitat requirements, or should I get rid of invasives first? Is it going to be a waste of time if I have some of these invasives here? And what are my management tools? Well, you got to plug the plant in where it wants to grow. You got to find the right habitat type. So do I have upland areas? Do I have upland, wetland areas? Real quick way to tell. Dig into the soils and look at the soils. This is an example of an upland soil and it's pretty much uniform in color and you don't have to know all the soil science terms to see this, but that typifies an upland soil. Whereas wetland soils, you see what are called models and you'll see these little orange circles or orange concretions or they might be reddish or they might be yellow or sometimes and that's iron or sometimes if it's manganese it might be black and so what what happens is you have this regime of wet dry wet dry in the wetland that's why it's called a wet land it's not called a lake it is a wet land so it seasonally becomes wet dry wet dry and so when it's wet and saturated well, the minerals in the soil go into solution. They become reduced. And then when the soil dries out, they oxidize. And they form these little uh, models. And so that's indicative of a hydric soil. Same thing, if you could see a little bit here, you can see oxidized root channels. You'll see where there's little root hairs or little tiny roots that go through the soil. And the minerals in the water that have gotten in those roots, they do the same thing. They will oxidize. They will turn a color when that soil dries out. Another in indicator of uh, well in soils. So even if you just have a small place with a patio, link up with someone who has some wetland areas. And it's kind of fun to grow wetland plants. This was in uh, June of 2007. You, you've probably seen this in some of my presentations before. And this was uh, Rincospera macrostachia, tall horn beak sedge. It was a, a county record, never been found before in Washington County. And we found it in the gas pipeline that separates the two sides of Woolsey Wet Prairie. And, I, and so if you're going to propagate seeds, just remember seeds need stratification or they might need uh, some kind of coal moist stratification, or they, they might need scarification, they might need to go through the digestive system of a bird. It's not as simple as just throwing seeds out there. And there are websites that you can go to to find out the germination requirements for native seeds. These, these I put them in a wet paper towel and put them in the refrigerator for about three months and then germinate them. And so they go from this stage to this stage. As far as uh, trees, this is a little area we call our wetland savanna area. And we planted uh, about 1,500 trees that we've gotten from the Forestry Commission nurseries. And I highly recommend using uh, tree tubes because during, you know, you're, going, you're getting the trees during the dormant season. You wanna plant them in late winter, early spring when it's dormant. And so the ground doesn't have much on it. You plant the tree. And, but then you go out there in July and there's stuff this tall. Let's see, now where's my tree? Do I want to mow here? A am I going to cut that tree accidentally when I mow? I really want to mow to cut the competition back from that tree. It's going to be stunning because all this other weeds are growing around it. And then you tie a little red ribbon around it and then you mow through there to mow around the tree and then finally you go, 
oh, there it is, I just cut it. And so these tree tubes help you see the trees if you want to use herbicides and spray around the trees and cut back the competition. The tree tubes are great for that too because it doesn't let the herbicide get on the trees. They're just a very simple mechanism. It's got a cane, a short piece of cane pole, a, a plastic tube and a, a cable tie on it. And it still lets sunlight through and the trees grow and some of the things that we planted three years ago, ball cypress, which is native to down there, but not native up here. Uh, we're starting to see some good size on them. And then you can also see, well, where have my trees failed? Where are my dead ones? Because they're standing out like a sore thumb sticking up in that tree tube. So I'll pull that tree tube out and I'll use it again to plant another tree. But we're starting, we're starting to get uh, our cypress trees and oak trees up to pretty good size. Okay, so you're gonna start attracting all of the wildlife. So you're gonna have pets and varmints and wascally wabbits. And some of that you're just gonna have to live with. And sometimes there are things you can do and sometimes you can. Sometimes it's what is the vegetation and the season doing this year? Some years the, the problems are worse than others. So this is a place where I, I used to live. And so what you see is, this is a food plot. This area right here is, is a uh, food plot that's right next to all my raised beds. And I, I never had any problems with wildlife getting in there and disturbing my beds, except in the fall, most of the stuff had died back and about the only thing still growing was a sweet basil. And I would see deer tracks inside those raised beds where they would jump up in those beds a sweet basil, but I never had much problem there. Where I live now, this is what I have to do. I never knew until a couple of years ago how much deer loved okra. I had had gardens all my life. I've never had deer bother okra. And at this particular place where we live now, I mean, an okra plant couldn't get a leaf that size on it before a deer would come bite it off. They wouldn't bother my tomatoes but the okra and the bell peppers, they were doomed. And so one of the things I did, you can, at Farmers Association or Lowe's, places like that, you can get this plastic netting. Then it's just a plastic mesh that's like eight feet tall. And so what I did is drove in the T post. Then I got some of the leftover cane poles from the, the tree tubes and just put a cable tie around there. And I, I put it up and I stood back and I thought, I can't see that netting there. The deer aren't going to be able to see it. So I put uh, uh, this flagging on there. And so all of this, I have not pulled a single weed from that garden this year. What I did is I took the time to plant in a big mound and I put the black weed block down around every plant. And then I put oat straw on top of it. And so I don't have to pull any weeds. But if the deer can see that, they stay out of there. Unfortunately, I don't have good tomatoes this year because Mother Nature has not been very kind in terms of water. So there's all kinds of widgets, gadgets, <laughs> things to get rid of the varmints and the wascally rabbits. <laughs> and, and so there are actually creative things like this on the shelf that you can buy. It's, it's some kind of pepper sauce that doesn't hurt the birds, the birds like it, but it'll burn the tongues of the squirrels. And yeah. And so a lot of this stuff I've, I've never seen work. Same with, with my garden. You know, you can buy the, um, the containers of dehydrated coyote urine. Keeps deer out of your garden. And just, you know, first time it rains, that scent's gone. And so the netting and dog hair is what's, what I've seen work better than anything else. I've gone to places, I've bought the $100 bird feeders that have the springs on them. If they, when the squirrel weight gets on there, it pulls down and the squirrel can't reach in there and get food, well, they eventually tear it up. So, another quick creative thing I do, parasite loads. The deer, the things I see on my cameras, the deer have tremendous parasite loads of ticks and that will kill fawns. And so in the background, what you see, see those little yellow things on that feeder is something I thought, how can I help them because it, it's really hard on them, plus the gnats that 
transmit the various other diseases. So you know, the farmers associate ivermectin. Ivermectin is the same thing as heart guard. It's you feed your dog for heartworms. And so I came up, well, I thought, well, how am I going to put it on them? And so I just got paint rollers and some little angle iron and bent out the ends and drill holes through them and put them on the legs of the feeder. And so when a deer reaches under there, a small deer is going to reach under it, it's going to rub some of that ivermectin on the side of its head. And if it reaches over it, it's going to rub, rub it under its chin. So hopefully that will get rid of the, the ticks, but they definitely get it on. Technical assistance, all right, we're going to wrap up. Help for publications, the different types of uh, agencies that can help, some really good publications that I like, wildlife friendly plants, gives uh, profiles of different type of species and what animals like to feed on them and where they like to grow and it has sections about encouraging and uh, sustaining wildlife, Ozark wildflowers so you can see well what's a good plant, what I want to have, what are its benefits, Quality Deer Management Association, this is pretty much the bible for if you want to do good size food plots for deer, quail, turkey, whatever, it has sections on the soils, has species profiles, uh, a backup, the, the thing that uh, came after that book was Beyond Food Plots, and it basically tells you, well, how do I manage what I have there? Do I have plums? How do I get those plums to survive better? Here's another book about forest plants and their wildlife uses. Here is the list of different websites that you can go to, whether you want to get a herbicide applicator's license or whatever in the back. I have uh, a list of all those websites and publications and things are cool. And here's something that Things as far as protecting and maintaining sustainable natural heritage and wildlife. Get your kids involved. Get them a book like that. And tell them you're going to show this to your kids and your grandkids someday because that's what it's all about. Sustaining it. Sustaining the values, not just the habitat. It takes sustaining the values to sustain the habitat. Thank you. Things that we're finding and trying to control invasive species like the uh, Japanese honeysuckle, they do extremely well in this drought along with the poison ivy. And uh, how do you handle poison ivy? Poison ivy, you, I would use uh, some uh, herbicide that is specific to broadleafs. And it, if you use something like glyphosate, Roundup, it kills everything. And so you have uh, grass-specific herbicides like clethodem that, that we use on tall fescue at Woolsey Wet Prairie. And then you have, it goes by the brand name Remedy, but it's a chemical called triclopur. And so it is uh, good for woody broadleaf plants that I use it on sweet gum. Unlike uh, glyphosate, you'll look on it, it'll have a tag on it, it'll say it's a restricted use chemical. And so you will need a herbicide applicator's license. You can go through the extension service, take a real brief course. It really helps you to learn what are the pros and cons of herbicides. And you can get a private herbicide applicator's license and buy those restricted use chemicals. It's all about training people. It works and it's gonna be fine if you read the label and use it properly. Triclopur. You said that the plastic netting is what you find works best to keep the deer out of your garden. Um, no, I had them, had them in there since I put that up. Is, is there anything else besides plastic netting to keep them out of like flower beds or anything like that? What it shows on the uh, packaging with this netting, that you do not go, go to Lowe's or Home Depot and look around in the garden center is usually where you find it. And so on the packaging, as far as the applications, you don't necessarily have to put it on post and make it a actual fence. It shows applications where you can drape it over bushes and plants and stake it down so that 
the herbivores can't get in there and, and get to it. Some of the hostas we've done that with, and then we take some of the dog hair and put on there. Silver on blackberries. I'd like to spray them, but I don't want to carry a lot of the clover and stuff. I've always just brushed all it to the ground, but I, I mean, I want to do a little bit more because it always comes back. And blackberries are good, but overrun. May, overrun. <laughs> yeah, it, it would take a raw leaf herbicide like Remedy, Triclopur. Okay. If, okay, the clover are typically they're gonna they're cool season and so you know wait till next month and watch that clover start to go dormant because they'll go dormant during the heat of the year and that's when you hit it. And hopefully it won't if the clover's dormant it it will not as likely hurt it. But you know what I do I've had areas that are very thick in, in blackberries and so I have areas that I think, well, okay, here's here's Blackberry Island. It's got a few per, uh, persimmon trees growing up through it. This is an area I'm gonna leave, and I just keep cutting, and I, I leave that one area. And it's rabbits and birds and all kinds of things live in there. And then there's other areas where it comes back, and I really don't want it. I want other things to grow, and I might bush hog it every two years, but the Blackberry Islands, I leave them. So it's just, you know, the diversity. Make it all diversity is the key to having diverse wildlife by creating diverse habitat. Do you have any suggestions for moles and voles in vegetable gardens? I want to do all these other things, in, but still uh, not to have them in the vegetable gardens. I don't know. I don't know if they make any of that uh, red hot stuff like, <laughs> like they do for the squirrels. I, I've never had that problem, but you know, I've seen the things, the, the little traps that you put down in the ground, and then I've seen areas where I mean, you see the ground all humped up. Where, where they go through there. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I've never personally had to deal with that one. Aubrey's here. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, everyone.